Hi, and welcome to Anna University's Brain Awareness Week podcast. The following episode is part of the student-led series on stress, how to manage it and how it impacts our brain. Hey everyone, here is Bettina and Nicola from Arden University and you are listening to our stress management podcast. We are psychology students at Arden. Myself, I am their graduate and Nicola here. Well, Nicola, feel free to introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Nicola Viros and I'm a level six undergraduate student um, with Arden University. Thank you, Nicola. So today we will talk about a somewhat less brain specific topic. So if you were listening to our previous episodes, then you might notice that we talked about the brain and stress mainly, but now we would like to address some more practical, perhaps even the most generally relatable aspect of stress management, and that is the good old occupational stress. Our guest speaker today is Alison Brown. Uh, students from Arden may know her from the occupational psychology module because, you know, she was actually my tutor, by the way, <laughs> and I am glad that she's here today with us. Ali, could you please introduce yourself in a bit more detail, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me along today. It's lovely to be with you. Yes, so my name is Ali Brown and I lead the occupational psychology module at Arden. Um, so I'm a psychology lecturer. I also work as a consultant business psychologist um, part time as well alongside my Arden work. So um, that's really exciting. It involves applying all sorts of occupational psychological theory to organisations to help to um, get the most out of their employees. So to look after employees well-being as well as their productivity, which they uh, those two do go hand in hand. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, as the focus of our episode today, could you introduce us to what occupational stress actually is? Like, what are we talking about when we refer to occupational stress? Okay, yes, of course. So, occupational stress, well, firstly, what we mean by that is um, occupational just means in the workplace. Um, so, we're talking about stress as it occurs in the workplace, which is, you know, quite unfortunately, quite a big um, topic these days. And stress at work really is the, it's the sum of the physical, mental and emotional strains that come from our interactions at work. So that might be our interactions with the environment at work, the technology, the things that we use to do our jobs, but also the interactions with people that come as part of that as well. And generally, it's important to know that we are resilient um, as human beings and we're well able to adapt to different demands and meet those demands. Um, but when those demands become excessive, when they exceed our adaptive capacities, that's when we feel stressed. So I think a quite a good um, analogy, I quite like to think of things in analogies and pictures, help them to understand them better. If you think about a tennis player, like one of the really impressive Wimbledon tennis players, um, you think about them in a tennis game, they have so much agility and balance and coordination and they're able to just move very quickly to meet the demands of, of the ball as they come flying over the net and to send it back, to respond appropriately, send that ball back. But if you imagine if they were in a really ridiculous scenario when there were you know, dozens of balls being thrown across the net all at once, they would that would exceed their adaptive capacities to meet all of those demands. Um, and, and that is sort of the definition of stress, really. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. It was a great analogy. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I you. Think about it that way. Um, so when you say uh, occupational stress, what are the factors that most commonly trigger or contribute to distress at a workplace these days? Yeah, so um, I think the best way to think about this is to, um, I'm briefly going to introduce you to a very simple model, um, a psychological model called the Job Demand Resources Model. And quite simply, that says that in the work, we have lots of demands that are placed upon us, as we know, physical demands, sometimes mental demands, emotional, psychological, social 
Um, so we have all those demands coming at us, but we also have resources, um, things that we can use to meet those demands. So again, physical resources, social, organisational and personal resources too. So our, you know, our, our hope, our efficacy, our self-efficacy, our resilience, our optimism, all of those personal resources. And what we want ideally is a, a really nice balance between the demands that are placed on us and the resources that we have to deal with those. Um, so those resources that we have, they might reduce the demands that come upon us or they might give us some really nice learning development opportunities or rewards. Um, but to come back to your question then, what causes stress at work? Those demands, you know, when those demands are too much um, and the resources are too little, that's where we feel the stress. So the demands could be physical demands. If you're in a very physically demanding job, um, emotional demands if you're in an emotionally demanding job um like care work for example social work um teaching so I used to be a teacher myself in a primary school um oh. and actually the, yeah the research shows that the um the jobs that are most stressful are where there's very high demand as you would expect but also if you have low control so if you don't have that autonomy um if you don't have that ability to adapt and do things in, in a, you know, in a, at a time that suits you, uh, you don't have the flexibility to fit it maybe around family life or other things, um, it's a combination of that high demand and low control um, that makes the job really quite stressful. Um, to come back to the tennis player analogy, if you imagine the tennis player um, doing his thing, but suddenly now he's got very low control, so perhaps his feet are planted to the ground and he cannot move his feet at all you know he can still got he's still got some range of movement with his arms to get to meet those tennis balls but his, he has that real lack of control so that becomes even more stressful and he's less and less able to meet the demand of those tennis balls coming yeah you said that something a uh, personal resilience so, so it's I assume it's individually different to everyone like this demand resilience relationship like for everybody has, like a, I guess, a different threshold that how much uh, demand can you take, like how much stress can you take until it affects you, start to affect you to a certain negative way, I guess. Is it is it so? Yeah, that's, that's right. So, um, yeah, our personal resources like resilience are just they're one kind of category of resources that we draw upon at work. Um, you know, and we draw upon those unconsciously most of the time. We don't realise that we're doing that. Um, so, yeah, definitely um, different individuals will have a different level of capacity for stress. Um, and our resilience is a part of that. It, it won't be the whole thing. Um, there'll be other factors in that as well. So um, another thing might be um, role conflict. So if we are trying to juggle multiple different roles, not as not maybe at work so much but if we have a work role that's demanding but also our role maybe as a mother or as a father um as a as a friend as a daughter I don't know all those different areas of life when they pull on us as well um that will have an impact on our on our stress levels yeah I see so perhaps um you know we could put the occupational stress into the frame of academia because you might already know this, but a few weeks ago at Arden University, uh, our stress management team ran a survey where we asked students and colleagues at Arden about how are they experiencing stress? And the responses were quite interesting. So uh, for sure, they indicated that tutors and students, they, they are all experiencing a lot of stress, but what are the factors in academic stress, if I can say it so? Are they similar mm -hmm. to what trigger work-related stress or is academic stress in some way different than work-related stress? Mm, great question. Um, for me, I think it's um, very, very similar. Um, as, and if we come back to that model, that job demands resources, then looking at the balance between the demands of academic life and the resources that we have as students, um, it's the same, you know, it's sort of the same equation that's going on there. So the demands might look slightly different to work demands. The resources might look slightly different. 
I think there's a lot of similarities um, between the two. Um, so in um, as a student, um, some of the demands that are on you are deadlines, um, appointments or, or Zoom sessions that you're trying to make it to um, for distance learners, um, the demands to write in a certain academic style or to respond to the feedback that you get, formative feedback or feedback from the coursework, financial demands as well. Um, so, that, you know, but we're still looking at those two categories, demands and resources. And the, the resources that you have, um, you know, there's lots of those as well and important to be aware of. And they will help um, to mitigate those demands and to reduce the stress. Um, so there's social support that is available to you by, um, you know, just reaching out and getting to know some of your fellow students as your personal academic tutor, who's a great source of support to you, your module leaders. Um, assessment materials, the feedback that you're given from your coursework and loads of great resources on the inclusion portal, for example. And even, you know, making sure you make the most of your modules and posting on the forums to get a little bit of feedback from other students or your tutor, that will serve as a resource that will just boost you a little bit and build you up. Um, I think it's really, it's interesting, I was, I was reflecting on this in preparation for this interview today, I was thinking as a student, I think um, it can feel like those demands that we mentioned, the deadlines, et cetera, they almost come and find you. <laughs> you know, they you you can't help but be super aware of those. Um, they're sort of these fixed demands, these fixed deadlines that are there um, and can feel quite looming. Whereas the resources, uh, whilst there's lots of those available, as I've mentioned, they actually kind of require you to reach out and go and find them. Um, so I think it's an important message to think, you know, let's let's just make sure we're doing that. Let's let's um, reach out a little bit more, let's stretch out a little bit more, and um, make a little bit more contact, you know, maybe with tutors or make the effort to um, chat with some of the the guys you see on your modules. Um, and in doing so, you're really building those resources that will help you um, to be very successful as a student, but also to reduce that uh, that sense of stress that you'll feel as well yeah. also you know how you mentioned all, all the available sources I assume that in many other universities beside Arden they have this kind of so social supportive re uh, resources but um, you know if you are studying in a university like me and Nicola for instance you also likely to be around people with similar interests like if you're on a course that probably all the others have interest in something that you do have interest in and perhaps that also, you know, provides a certain social support for you. Like you can talk about studying to other students. Meanwhile, at the workplace, yeah, you might have people from different backgrounds, different interests. It's more diverse, I would say. Um, maybe that's also uh, a difference between academic and, and occupational stress factors. But I, what do you think? Yeah, great. That's great. That's a really good way of thinking about it. And so lovely to think that you are even virtually surrounded by people who have probably got very similar interests to you. Um, and yeah, by just making a little bit of effort and like trying, you know, reaching out and maybe mm -hmm. contact one person one to one, um, that could re really be a beneficial relationship that helps both of you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, dealing with the same problems, same assignment, specifically in the development of stressful situations, both at workplace and as a student. Yeah, um, really important question, because I think um, it's really important to acknowledge that social relationships and work relationships are kind of both uh, resource and demand. You know, the demand of interacting with your, can feel like a demand to interact with your tutors or your work colleagues. Um, and sometimes that takes some careful navigating. Sometimes um, maybe we're not pleased with the way something's been handled at work or uh, we want to ask a question about some feedback that we've had that feels a little uncomfortable. We demand um, those, navigating those relationships. But equally, um, they can be even more so a really excellent resource um, and something that will really help our well-being, as we've as we've already talked about. Um, 
So I guess the question is, what can we what can we do about that? Is it harder if you're a distance learning student or or blended, where you do a lot of your work independently? Um, and like I've mentioned before, I think it's just being brave enough to take a step um, every now and then to sort of see if you can make contact with someone that you know whose name you've come across maybe on the modules and make a message and strike up a bit of a conversation. Um, you know, go along and join in. Zoom sessions, even if uh, maybe sometimes they're not in convenient times, um, but go ahead and um, push yourself to ask a question at the end and sort of get your face and your name out there and hopefully get to know some other people as you take those small steps. Um, yeah. And and surround yourself with good people, I think, as well. And I think it's important with social relationships to think about quality over quantity. Um, you know, mm. we can often think of the number of, I don't know, the number of people we're connected to on or number of followers on Instagram or something. Um, but they're very, you know, um, mostly going to be very shallow quality. Yeah. Of relationships. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but it's making sure that we have those good, deeper friendships that we're um, investing in as well with people who we can talk about the stressful things with we can really be honest with um and those relationships develop don't they as we we kind of take little risks with each other and we start to share those deeper things see what feedback we get see what works with that relationship and kind of being brave enough to take those steps yeah very relevant these days you know where social media and home office and everything is just so important to our lives and it's you know uh, Almost everybody I know has social media and, you know, like this trend of how many followers you have, blah, 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 these kind of things. It, it can be, you know, very stressful for a person, especially, you know, for younger people who take this kind of social media platforms very seriously. And it might affect them also very negatively the way they're thinking about it. And so overall, social relationships play an important role in coping with stress. What would you say about that? Yes, absolutely. I think we have to acknowledge that they can contribute to, spe- to stress sometimes, but yes, um, they definitely are a, a big resource in coping with stress as well. And, you know, we get to, I guess we, we have power over our relationships, don't we? We get to choose who we spend time with, who we share certain things with. So we can take control of that, I think, and invest in those relationships that we find rewarding and where those people find our investment rewarding as well. Um, and that will be an excellent buffer of stress, definitely. Yeah. Next question. Hi, Ali. Um, do you think that the increasing popularity at home, office and distance learning will create a change in the prominence of occupational and academic stress as an issue? Yeah. Hi, Nicola. Yeah, so... Um, Definitely, you know, the increase in remote working does have an impact, I think, on on stress. And that's what we can compare that to distance learning as well, can't we, where we're working Mm. independently from home. And I think one of the main impacts to be aware of is that I feel that um, working from home and working independently, that it can exaggerate the demands that we feel of the work. Mm of the of the study um just because we are now more than ever in those setups we're relying on the 24 7 um 24 7 on you know culture availability Uh, yeah yeah so we have that constant access to our learning materials that constant access to our emails um Mm. you know you can if you really wanted to you can you could be checking those and responding and going through those in the middle of the night which is obviously not a good recommendation um but I think then what it means is we have to become much wiser at putting in those healthy boundaries um yes that can be more and more difficult when we're working remotely and working from home or studying from home because it might be that well we've got triggers all around us all the time haven't we for our work and you know I I can still have my laptop there in the evening even though we're not using it and it's it's, it can trigger that that feeling of, of stress or, or tempt you to go back into work mode when really you should be relaxing or spending time with your family. 
So I think it just means that um, it doesn't have to be more stressful working from home and studying from home, definitely not. But I think it just there's different implications on how we manage that. And the, again, role yeah. conflict theory that I mentioned earlier, we can start to feel that uh, when we're working from home and that the work or the studies introduced into our home environment, there's the potential for more of that role conflict. So, you know, you yes. see your kids might be around while you really want to finish off some emails. That happens to me on a fairly daily yeah. basis. Um, and yeah, again, making sure that you plan that, you think about what's important, you think about what your values are, and you plan your time and put in firm boundaries for yourself um, to ensure that you're not feeling conflicted like that. Um, yes. And you know, different practical tips can help with that as well. Um, it's not always possible, but if you do happen to have the space in, at home, um, working in a different environment to where you relax in the evening can be really helpful for managing those um, boundaries and reducing yeah. that stress as well. Yeah. Yeah, you actually just answered my next question. I was going to ask you, um, now that our offices are, at least in many cases, not separated from your private home, how would you suggest consciously to switch off from work um, or study mode to private mode? Um, but as you said, you know, having a separate space or an office, even if it is a spare bedroom where you close the door and you only go back during your working hours the next day what would you what else would you suggest yeah um so I think what you need to be aware of with stress especially is that is an unconscious reaction that we have it's like a stimulus think of the stimulus the other stimulus response um equation um yeah. certain stimuli will will cause us to respond with a, a stress response so it's being yes. aware of that and things so so things we can do to help ourselves is just to manage our environment to reduce those stresses and those stimuli when we're not working. So it's perhaps doing things like actually physically putting away your laptop in a drawer or underneath a desk so you're not looking yeah. at it anymore. I think changing clothes as well. Um so you might have your work clothes on for the day, you know, not necessarily smart clothes, you're probably not working, you know, yes. at least time. the top off. <laughs> Yeah, but you can change, change into something more relaxed when you've finished work. And that really helps me to relax when I put my one day on at the end of a working day. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's those, yeah, that, like giving ourselves those stimuli or, you know, making yourself a cup of tea at the end of the day every time yes. you finish work. Like putting in some little routines and things like yes. that that over time will trigger to us, ah, I'm in relaxation mode now. I think that can really help. Yeah. And then my last question, um, what are some effective ways of coping with occupational and academic stress that you, as an occupational psychologist, would recommend? Mm, yeah. So I would say one thing that I'm learning to do is to uh, prioritise my well-being and making sure I plan that in. So uh, something I've been doing on my module now with a student is a Wellbeing Wednesday. Um, and I've gotten so much out of doing that because I always, you know, well-being is important, but it's easy for that to sort of slip to the bottom of your to-do list. Um, but on the Wednesday, I make sure that I share with the students one thing that I've done for my well-being that day. And that's been so nice because over time I've learned to anticipate that on a Wednesday and think oh yeah I, I do want to do something for my well-being today it's been another week and you know what can I do when we have this menu of different things we choose from so it might be taking a bath or going for a walk and I've been challenging myself to do something different every week so that's been helpful um, and then a link to that I guess I've been um, making sure I plan my time better and actually plan in rest time as well. Because I'm not, it doesn't come naturally to me to over plan. I'm not like a super, I'm not a super organized planning type person. Um, I tend to be naturally a little bit more like um, scatty, um, you could say. Um, but I've been learning to plan in a little bit more and actually plan in evenings to rest. And what I'm finding is it's so beneficial because I feel like I deserve that rest by the evening. 
And the difference is maybe before I was, I would have rested in the evening anyway, but I maybe would have, there would have been niggling thoughts going, oh, you could really be getting on with that thing or you should really, maybe you ought to be doing some cooking or sorting something out for the kids. But when I've planned it in, I can actually really savour it and enjoy it. Um, And then the other thing I wanted to comment on here, something that I do, is just consciously manage the way that I think about work and the demands that are on my life. Um, Because Mm. I'm involved in a lot of different things. Um, And one thing I I think is really powerful is that it's the things that we tell ourselves about work and the things that we tell ourselves about study um, the, the, those thoughts that we practice over and over again, they really do have a, a powerful influence on our brain and how we think and how we respond. So one thing I often think about is, um, I think about this, might sound a bit bizarre, but I think about this image of a puppet or a marionette, which is a type of puppet, you know, an old fashioned kind of puppet that's got a lot of different strings on. So it's got a string on its knee to move it and a string on its lower leg and a string on its foot and all over its body. It's got all these strings. And the puppeteer is um, manipulating the puppet, pulling on all those different strings in a very coordinated way um, to animate the puppet. And I think of my work and all the different things I'm involved in in life as being like those strings. And what I what I'm getting at there when I think about that is that actually all these different things that I'm involved in my work my charity work my time with my kids my consultancy work my time with friends etc they're actually all they all different strings and them pulling on me is a really positive thing because it animates me and it brings life and um it it you know it can make you dance it brings it brings life and joy and good stuff um, it's not a stress. It's not a stress to have all those things pulling on you. It actually brings that energy and life and, um, yeah, brings things to life. And that's the way I like to think about work and things I'm involved in. And, you know, I think having that really positive outlook and rehearsing those positive thoughts um, can really help us with managing our stress as well. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Very interesting, Ali. Thank you so much um, for answering our questions. All right. Well, I hope that, you know, those of you who are listening, you found this episode very interesting. And, you know, I can only talk from my own own point of view here, but personally, I always felt that stressing events from my academic and work environment were and always are the ones that affect me the most in contrast of, you know, other types of environments like my family conflict, for instance. And I personally felt that talking about a more mundane application of psychology would be a good fit for a closure of our stress management series. So because, you know, our occupations are taking up a lot of space and a lot of nerves in our lives. And yes, I hope you enjoy this episode. Unfortunately, this was our last one, but feel free to check out our other two episodes where we talk about more brain-related aspects of stress as well as address mindfulness. On this note, more content specifically made for Brain Awareness Week has been and will be published during this week made by my fellow Arden University students, graduates, students, and colleagues. Some truly interesting and brain-related content, I have to say. So thank you for taking part in our episode, Ali. It was great talking to you. And also, Nicola, thank you for being part. And everyone who was listening to us, thank you, guys. 